the need arises, not necessarily in chronological order. So generally, when you look up any modern physics textbook like Survey or Gianpoli or Ohanian, the approach that is taken is chronological. It starts off with the photoelectric effect, it starts off with Planck's law, with the radiation law, then it talks about Davis and German experiment, Green Bohr's theory, and so on. And then it gradually builds up quantum mechanics. However, I would like to take the more conceptual approach. We are standing at a vantage point, which means that we have 200 years of, or almost 150 years of quantum physics behind us, and we are at a certain vantage point in history. So we can take a panoramic view, and we can pick and choose whatever topics we like to cover. So first of all, this is going to be a modern approach to modern physics, rather unconventional. There's no one textbook that you, that you follow, so you have to look at uh, your own sources. You have to dig up your own resources. Of course, I'll be here to guide you. The second thing is that the material for this course will not be uploaded on LMS. Rather, it will be uploaded on, on thislab.org. And in this, on this website, if you go to a link on academics and courses taught, you'll be able to find modern physics in 2018. And you'll also be able to find my previous offering of this course from 2013, 2011, even earlier. And you will find out that every time I teach this course, it's totally different. Now this is a four credit art course, a few logistics, I will not discuss the logistics again, hopefully. It's a four credit hour course. Three credit hours will be focused on, on a development of quantum theory. All right? So quantum theory is one of the most important theories mankind has ever invented. And it's a powerful theory. What do we mean by powerful when we talk about physics? Powerful means it describes a large variety of natural phenomena. And it gives us the tools to build and invent new devices which help mankind. So it's a very powerful theory. And there is hardly a natural occurrence that negates or nullifies or puts even the slightest of dents on quantum theory. So, powerful thing. So about three quarters of this course, we will be talking about quantum theory in different in, in different forms and, and and the different facets of quantum theory. And one credit R, which is one fourth of the course, will be dealing with what is called Statistical mechanics. Now, statistical mechanics is a way to understand energy, how energy is distributed inside a system, what is entropy, how do we define entropy, what is free energy, what is internal energy. So it basically deals with energy and its distribution from a microscopic perspective. And I'm going to link up quantum theory with statistical mechanics. All right, so it's a tall ask for a freshman course. We have a lot to cover. Luckily, it's a long class as well. It's a two hour long class. Uh, generally, I like talking a lot and so Hopefully, this is not going to be a very exhaustive, exhausting class for me, but and I and I hope that I'll be able to keep up your interest for for the duration of the class. We have some break as well. So, but this is the objective that I have laid out for myself in this 
in this course. I would like to give you an overview of quantum theory. So after April or May 2018, when you walk out the doorstep of this classroom, you should be able to feel comfortable with the fact that this, the nature that we see around us works quantumly. Okay, you, you must have this inner satisfaction that nature is quantum. And quantum mechanics can describe nature. Remember, what differentiates a physicist from a non-physicist? I'm sure all of you, most of you, are not going to become professional physicists. A very few of you might, might be interested in taking up a physics major, unfortunately. But the point of teaching physics to you is that any scientist or engineer must think on the other side of the wall, must be able to look beyond the curtain. And what is the curtain? The curtain is biology. So let me explain what I said. We are products of biology. We are products of evolution, for example. So we look at our surroundings in a particular in a particular way. Our mode of thinking is biological. And it is governed by by necessity, by the law of necessity. We don't have to understand quantum mechanics to understand nature. Because we live in an average universe. We live in a biological universe. We, we don't know what the uncertainty principle is because we are dealing with large number of particles. We are dealing with a hot, warm universe. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, deals generally with the very small, with the microscopic particles, with what's inside an atom. How does an electron behave? How does a single photon behave? How does an electron interact with a photon? How do subatomic particles behave? How do atoms come close together and form bonds inside a molecule? Generally speaking, we don't have to go inside a molecule and we don't even deal with single molecules. When you do a reaction in the chemistry laboratory, you're actually mixing portions and in those portions there are Avogadro's numbers of molecules. You're not dealing with a single molecule. So you're not dealing with bonds per se. So you're dealing with large amounts of objects. You're dealing with macroscopic amounts of objects. So on this scale, quantum behavior is averaged out. And you only see average quantum behavior. And average quantum behavior is the classical universe, is the world that we live in, is the biological universe. So we don't see quantum mechanics in our daily life, generally. Sometimes we do. For example, if you look at laser light, you could never look into a laser light, but if you find laser beam, a laser is only described by quantum mechanics. Sometimes you do, but most often than not, you are dealing with a classical universe which is non-quantum. So, quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. And what a physicist has the ability to do is that he can look beyond the veil set by biology, he can look into the quantum world. And my goal is to try my level best to teach you how to look beyond the veil, beyond the curtain. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I cannot foresee the future, or I'm not a Sufi, or I'm not a Dervish who can tell you about the spiritual universe. But what I can do is I can break the shell of everydayness that is around you, each one of you, and I can teach you how to think like a physicist. Okay, and even if you become a scientist. Uh, a biologist or a chemist or an electrical engineer, and most of you would like to become computer scientists these days, or programmers these days, I would like to have in you the ability to think quantum mechanically. Okay, so this is the goal for myself. You have to set your own goals. What you would like to achieve from this class. The second thing is, I would like to teach you statistical mechanics. <clears throat> There are, four, there are certain laws of thermodynamics 
that make the universe run. The first law of thermodynamics, which is just the law of conservation of energy, is the second law of thermodynamics that tells us what is probable and what is feasible. So I would like to teach you that these laws actually make the universe run. And I would like to give a microscopic understanding of these laws. So these are the goals that I have for myself. Now I welcome questions anytime. You can ask a question anytime. I can speak in most of the languages that you know. So I'm not, if, if you can't understand my description or narrative anywhere, you can ask questions. You can ask in English, you can ask in Urdu, no problem, and I can describe. I can describe in different ways. So what I would like to do is, I would like to take everyone along. Of course I cannot take everyone along, but I'll try to take most of you along. So ask questions. And the, the normal etiquettes of discipline inside a classroom have to be maintained. Because knowledge comes with some form of discipline. With, it comes with some form of self-restraint. Alright, so this is one obli obligation that I thrust upon you. This is something that is quite important. And I do not want a few students to disturb everyone else. And I'm quite strict about this. Alright? Alright, so this uh, session is also being video rec recorded. Uh, and hopefully, in due course of time, I'll be able to upload these videos on the internet as well. We're going to have quizzes. We're going to have the usual stuff, homeworks, individual homeworks, collaborative homeworks. We're going to have a midterm, we're going to have a final. But I don't pay much attention to, to logistics. I focus more on the content. We also have a, a team of PAs to, to communicate with this large size class for conducting tutorials as well. I've yet to select the tiers, but I'll do that this week. And you can always email me. And this is my email address. Alright, so any questions about a general overview of quantum of any questions? Yes? Have a question? Yes? Well, the words law and theories, they are just misnomers. A law is not something more sacred than a theory. A theory is a set of principles and mathematical formalism that describe certain happenings. When you say Coulomb law, Coulomb's law, for example, or gravitational law, or Newton, Newton's law, these are also theories. Uh, and a theory is not less sacred or not less effective than a than law. So these words are misnomers. So, Laws and theories in scientific parlance don't mean the same as what they would mean in, in a dictionary. Yes? <coughs> Sorry? Either B or B minus. <laughs> now, I hate questions of this kind, but I love it that you asked on the very first day. Okay. Now, now the problem is that if you just focus on the grade, the videos are being uploaded, you don't have to come to class. I would like to build an atmosphere inside this class, inside this classroom, which cherishes learning, which enjoys learning, which is fascinated with learning physics, 
So this is the kind of atmosphere I would like to build. Okay, it's going to be a relative grading scale, and that's my least concern. That might be your most important concern, and I would like to sympathize with you if you think that way. Because life is not just what grade that you would get in a modern physics class or in a mechanics class. Okay? So I set the I set my general practice. I generally give a B or a B minus on on it. All right. Now, what I would like to start off this course with is is a tenet is a tenet of physics. Do you understand the word tenet? Is a principle of physics, and that tenet is called wave particle duality. Are most of the class is most of the class comprising of freshmen? Do we have sophomores as well <coughs> and juniors? All right, so it's mostly freshmen. A few sophomores. Uh, why did the sophomores not take this class earlier? It's All right, so I would like to start off this discussion with wave-particle duality. Now, duality, we all know, is, is the property of existing in, a, in tandem in a, as a couple. And what do we mean by wave-particle duality is that objects, and by objects, I mean anything physical. Objects can have two characters at the same time. One is the character of being a wave, and the other is the character of being a particle. Now, first of all, we have to understand what is meant by a wave and what is meant by a particle. First of all, let's consider a wave. Now, suppose I have, I would like to describe this notion of, of a wave. I would like to ask the class what idea comes to their mind when they think of, of waves. What's a wave? What do you think of a wave? Yes, anyone? Yes? Transfer of energy from one point to the other. Transfer of energy from one point to another. All right. So this is a piece of chalk. I throw this chalk. So you can hear a sound over there. So energy is transferred. Is this a wave? So wave, so there's another concept that's come up. A wave is the transfer of energy without the transfer of, of matter. Is that true? Not necessarily. So a tsunami, a tsunami is a giant wave which in, in which mass can actually move from one point to another. Yes. So there is some concept of periodicity. All right, that's another nice concept. A disturbance. So that's a more literal meaning of wave. All of these concepts that you highlighted actually qualify, build up our understanding of what a wave is. So a wave is a large concept. It has all of these components. And generally, when we talk, of, if you look up the dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, a wave is associated with some kind of undulation. <clears throat> undulation means something that is going to and fro, up and down, left and right, in a periodic fashion. Not purely periodic, there is some repeti repetitive element to a wave. For example, if I ask you to draw a wave, 
All right? So this is something that you all do. If I ask you to draw a wave, this is the kind of picture that you draw. Right? Now this drawing in itself captures a lot of information. And when we talk uh, in our everyday lives about a wave, we generally have some undulation. Undulation means to and fro motion. Okay? Something that is going up or down. Now what is going up or down depends upon the kind of wave we are talking about. So if I draw this picture here, I would like to associate axes with this. What does the x-axis represent? What does the vertical axis represent? For example, this axis would represent time. And this axis would represent some degree of motion, some particular property inside the medium, or it could even be in vacuum, which is undergoing wavy motion, which is undergoing undulation. Undulation literally means going up and down. Okay? So something is waving in a wave. Something is undulating in a wave. Now that something depends upon the kind of wave we're talking about. For example, if you produce waves inside water, and the resulting waves are called water waves, and if you have a certain piece of, of uh, uh, an object that is standing still on a precise location inside that tank of water, and you produce waves, then that object, that boy, is going to boy up and down. It's going to undulate while it remains on its position. Localized, it remains at a certain value of x, and it's going up and down. So what is waving in a water wave is the vertical position of that object. All right, so this is a water wave. If you have a seismic wave, which is produced in, in an earthquake, for example, then the, what is waving, that would represent the local density of, of the Earth's crust. Or it could represent the local pressure on, in the Earth's crust. <coughs> if you talk about sound waves, then this waving motion, this axis represents the pressure of air. Alright? So something is waving inside a wave. Something is oscillating inside a wave. And this vertical degree of freedom could represent something which is particular to that kind of wave. It, for sound, it's the pressure of air. For water waves, it's the vertical displacement of an object. Okay? And it need not be a medium. For example, if light is being transmitted in vacuum, then it's also a wave. And what would be the oscillating quantity inside the light wave? It's going to be an electric and magnetic field. <coughs> For example, <coughs> if I represent the electric field like this, E. This is the time axis. Now this would represent an electromagnetic wave or light. I could also draw a magnetic field. So if the electric field is polarized <coughs> in the vertical plane, the magnetic field is polarized in the horizontal plane. And both the electric and the magnetic field go hand in hand inside an electromagnetic wave. This is again the time axis. So something is oscillating in a wave. It's undulating. Now, we could also have a scenario in which we draw another kind of picture. For example, I draw the same wave. <coughs> now what I would like to do is, I have a camera. Consider water waves. I have a camera that takes a picture of a wave at a certain instant in time. This diagram that I've drawn in which the 
horizontal axis represents time. This is at a fixed location. So this diagram that I've drawn is at fixed location, x naught, some x naught. There's another way of drawing a wave. If I have a camera that takes a picture of, of something that's waving, then that snapshot that emerges from the camera is at a fixed point in time, but it takes an image over a larger area of space. So I can draw a wave with respect to position x as well. So this image is the image of a wave frozen in time. Okay? So this is the location x at a fixed time. Let's call it c naught. Now here I have, again I have some disturbance y. So this is another way of representing a wave. So I can represent it with respect to time and I can represent it with respect to location. The wave is propagating forward in space. This is what this picture represents. All right? And this picture represents that the same wave is oscillating in time. This is a time oscillation of the wave. This is a spatial progression, a spatial propagation of the wave. Okay? So here I'm using the word propagation. The wave is propagating in space. <laughs> propagation in space. And this image over here represents oscillation in time. Now both of these are legitimate representations of wave. Two, way, two ways of looking at the same wave, which is going forward in space and it's also oscillating in time. Both of these spatial and temporal uh, dynamics happen at the same time. This is spatial, I'm using this word spatial with respect to space, and anything with respect to time is called temporal. So a wave is a spatio-temporal phenomenon. Now, the physicists are they always like mathematics. And there is an inescapable relationship between physics and math. So what I would like to do is, first off, I talk a lot, as you can imagine. Second, I like to draw pictures. And the last thing that I generally do, after talking about the concept and the pictures, is I would like to introduce some math. So now every phenomenon would like to be describable by a mathematical model. I would like to draw how can I represent this wave mathematically. Now, suppose this is a sinusoidal wave. Remember, there are other kinds of waves as well. This is the simplest kind. I can have a wave, for example, let me draw another kind of wave. So this is another wave. It's, it's a disturbance. It's not periodic in space. It's aperiodic. But still, this does transfer energy from one place to another, this kind of phenomenon. At time t equals t naught, this is a picture of the wave. At some later time, if I take a camera and draw a picture, then this object will have propagated forward. So now this is an image at some t1, <coughs> greater than t0. At some later instant in time, if I take a camera and draw, a take a picture, this will be the position of this disturbance. This is also a special, this is also a wave. According to physics, this is also a wave. This kind of wave is given a special name. It's generally called a pulse. Okay? 
pulse or physicists like to use fancy words, they call it a wave packet. <coughs> this is also a wave or a wave packet or a pulse. And we learned that this pulse is made up of many sinusoidal waves. Anyway, both of these qualify as waves, but this is the simplest of waves. All right? This is the simplest to describe mathematically. And what I would like to do now is I would like to write a mathematical expression for this wave. Look at this picture. It's periodic. This disturbance is periodic. Can we come up with a mathematical representation of this phenomenon? Can we come up with a formula or some mathematical image of this picture? Yes. Sine or cos. Okay. So what should I write? If I would like to write, if I look at this image, what I would like to write is y equals, what should I write? <coughs> sine. Sine of what? Sine k plus x, omega t. Just look at this picture. Suppose time is zero. Now this is periodic. Periodicity means that the distance between these points which are in phase is fixed. Lambda. I call this a wavelength. So can I now write the argument of this function? Sine of x? There's no t. t is 0. Because I'm looking at only how does this y vary with x. This has to be some function of x. All right. Sine of lambda x? Yes? x plus lambda. lambda. Sine lambda x. <coughs> it has to be sine 2 pi over lambda x. <laughs> First of all, there are two inadequacies in this mathematical representation. It's partially correct. First of all, what I could do, I could draw a bigger undulation like this with the same wavelength but bigger in amplitude. So this green wave has the same wavelength but it's bigger in amplitude. So I need to have some factor here that represents amplitude. A. I multiply this with A or add A? Multiply. I multiply with A. It's a scalar. So A sine of 2 pi x over lambda. But let me draw two pictures. The first picture that I draw is this way. Again with respect to x. The second picture that I draw is a wave of the same wavelength, okay, but which is differs from this original wave, it's displaced. Now the green wave has the same amplitude as the first wave and it has the same wavelength. So there has to be something in the mathematical formula that represents this relative displacement between the waves. Okay? That thing is called phase. So there has to be something in that formula that, in, that encapsulates phase. So what we've done, look at the properties of the wave. Amplitude, wavelength, and phase. And of course, the shape of the wave. 
The shape of the wave is something basic. This is also a wave. <coughs> Electrical engineers <coughs> like to draw waves of this kind. This is also a wave. So the shape is something basic. And that shape determines this function. It could be sine, it could be triangular, it could be anything. Okay. So once you define the function, you have to define the amplitude, the phase, and the wavelength. So in order to put this phase into the formula, I have to make a modification. And what I'd like to do is y equals a sine 2 pi over lambda x plus some phase pi. So this is a general representation of a sinusoidal wave, very general, of the simplest wave that I can think of. My, you might come up with a more simpler, a simpler wave, but this is as simple as I can think of. Now where does this 2 pi over lambda come up from? If I put x equals 0, this term goes to 0, and I get a sine of pi. So the phi represents y, the value of y at x equals 0. So I'm choosing a reference point. I'm choosing an origin for the wave. At the origin, I put x equals 0, and the amplitude of my wave becomes a sine of phi. So the phase determines what's the amplitude at the origin. So this phase just shapes the origin, in other words. I can choose a phase, or I can choose an x. I can choose to start counting my x variable where the phase is 0. So this is just a reference. Okay? And where, do, where does 2 pi over lambda come from? Suppose I have y equals a sine of 2 pi over lambda x naught plus pi. This is the value of y at x naught. Now if x naught changes by lambda, let's see what happens. Right? So I have a certain point on this wave. Let's look at let me draw white the white width again. I have a certain point. I look at the value of y at this value of x, which is x naught. So my y at x naught is given by a sine of 2 pi over lambda x naught plus pi. Alright? So this is, if, if this were a graph actually, then this value here would be this. Now what I would like to do, I've defined my wavelength in such a way that if I change my position by how much lambda, I get the same value for the disturbance. This is how I've defined my wavelength. So now what I would like to do, I would like to find out the value of y at x naught when I advanced my x by lambda. So now instead of x naught, I would like to find the value of the wave at x naught plus lambda. I would like to find the value of the wave here. So the picture is clear, but let's do it mathematically. This becomes a sine of 2 pi over lambda x naught plus 2 pi over lambda into lambda plus 5. So this is simply the original 
plus a factor of 2 pi. All right, and this is going to be the same as this. There's no difference. So if I advance by plus lambda or minus lambda or integral multiples of it, I would get the same value for the wave. Right? That's why I have this 2 pi over lambda. Now generally, this factor here, you don't want to keep on writing 2 pi over lambda over and over and over and over again. We call it k. This k is called the wave vector. Wave vector. So your formula can also be written as k sine of kx plus Five. Yes, you had a question. <laughs> so if instead of x naught, I have x naught plus lambda. So I advance in position by lambda. Then I get this is the argument. So this becomes a sine of 2 pi x naught over lambda plus pi plus 2 pi. Now this is a sine function and if I change the sine function by multiples of 2 pi, nothing changes. Alright? So I, so I have to have this factor 2 pi over lambda in the formula to ensure the periodicity of the sine function, which has a period 2 pi. Okay? So this is my general formula for a wave. Okay. Now could it be cosine kx plus phi? Could I write cosine kx plus phi? Okay. If I just change the phase to pi by 2, it automatically becomes a cosine kx plus phi. So this phi is our choice. How do we define the origin of the x-axis? It's purely our choice. But it becomes important when we talk about superposition as I'll explain. Now this is one mathematical formula for this picture that we do, in which we were looking at the spatial uh, variation. What if I would like to write uh, like, if I would like to write an equation or a mathematical form for this temporal variation, could you just write down the formula in your notebooks? Corresponding to the formula that I wrote for the spatial uh, the, uh, variation, I would like to write a formula for the temporal variation. Very good. So it's a completely analogous 
mathematical formula for the temporal variation. Complete analogous. All right. Now I now I'm trying to write a formula for this picture at some fixed x naught, which will be zero. That formula is y is now a function of time. Some amplitude a sine of two pi over the corresponding period in the temporal scale is for the time period. Time is now a variable, salty. Capital T is my time period plus a phase, phi. Or this 2 pi over capital T is called the frequency, omega. A sine omega t plus phi. <laughs> omega is called frequency. K is the analogous. Analogous means milka milka. K is the analogous, analogous quantity in the spatial domain. In space domain. So K sometimes also called the spatial frequency. The frequency in space. Okay? It's a different name for the wave vector. <coughs> now these two forms are for a wave which is either in the spatial domain or the temporal domain. But the actual wave is propagating both in space and in time. So we have to combine these two aspects together. The actual wave is spatio-temporal. It's propagating both in space and in time. So now we have to combine these two aspects together. In other words, look at this phenomenon over here. We have this white picture now, okay, this is, I described something else, so I don't want to confuse you. What I would like to now have a mathematical form for is the following description. This is my x-axis. This is my disturbance, whatever it is. Now, at some value of time, this is my wave. This is at some time t naught. At another time, the entire wave has propagated forward. To the right, for example. So if I take a snapshot at some later time, this is what the wave looks like. The wave has gone forward. So this is at some later time, t1. At yet some later time, the wave has moved even forward. It's propagated even further ahead. This is at some t2, greater than t1. And likewise, Now this is the actual wave that I'm talking about. Now what I would like to do, I would like to somehow graph these two mathematical descriptions together into the same formula. So that I have one formula that describes this propagating wave. <coughs> Alright? Now how can I do that? Quite easy. I see what I, now my function wave, which is just a function of x as well as of time. Okay? So now I have a spatial temporal function. Of course it has an amplitude, sine. I can combine these two aspects in the following way. Kx minus omega t 
plus 5. <coughs> now this is a juncture for a 10 minute break. We take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll be from me exactly after 10 minutes. And please be here after 8 or 9 minutes. And we'll take up from here.